Next section in the book, chapter 13 through 15, wildlife. When they were safely out of sight of the road in the farmhouse, Eric began to relax a little. He'd been so busy with his own thoughts and he hadn't been paying attention to what Quill was doing. Now he realized that Quill wasn't just ambling along in front of him, she was hunting. With her nose to the ground, she raced along until she caught an interesting scent that either halted her in her tracks for further investigation or sent her off in a new direction. Sometimes she stopped, lifted her head, sniffed the air, and chased after a scent borne by the breeze. Eric knew that his puny human nose was at least a million times less discriminating than Quill's, which was why he had no idea what the tantalizing odors were that were riveting her attention but he found it fascinating to watch her. She was running along the border between a brusher, brushy hedge grow and a field of wheat stubble. The grain had already been harvested, but a fair number of wheat kernels had been left behind on the ground. Suddenly, Quill's body became tense, her attention more focused. Her tail, which had been wagging happily, began to beat back and forth so quickly it was almost a blur. Then she made a quarter turn and slammed to an absolute standstill. Her gaze was fixed straight ahead at the hedgerow. Her tail stood out horizontal and motionless now. And her right paw was lifted as if she'd been asked to shake. She looked exactly like the etching on Dan's gun. Quill was on point. Eric was so entranced by her performance that for a full minute he just stood watching. Quill's concentration never wavered. Eric scanned the brush where the dog's gaze was pinned. For the life of him, he couldn't see anything but grass and browning weeds. Time stood still in the warm, quiet air. What is it, girl, he whispered. Is something there? He took a tentative step forward. Quill looked over at him for one split second, an expression on her face that seemed to say, You smell that too, right? Are you ready? And... <clears throat> In a flurry of wings, a pheasant rose into the air, cackling in outrage. It seemed to hang in the air for a moment. Even if its rooster-like cry hadn't given away it was a male, Eric got a clear look at it, his long trailing tail feathers, and the gleam of green, red, and white on its head. It flew swiftly into the far distance and out of sight, leaving a single white dropping as a protest. Eric was so startled he nearly lost hold of his gun. He gasped and watched as the bird disappeared. Quill had flinched slightly and taken a few steps when the bird first took off, but now she was back on point. It's gone, girl, said Eric when he had recovered from his surprise. Eric ignored him, or Quill ignored him. That was a great point, Quill, but the bird's gone. It flew away. Quill continued to stare into the hedgerow, her paw lifted and her entire body quivering. Eric moved closer to her, to her, wondering if there was a command he was supposed to, to give to release her. Hadn't she seen the bird fly? How long would she stay like this? What was she doing? Quill, he began, and at that moment, a hen pheasant, then two, three, seven, ten more, broke from the cover of the hedgerow. Smaller than the male, dull brown in color, and silent except for the furious whirl of their wing beats, they flew off in all directions. Eric's amazement was quickly followed by dismay. Some hunter you are, he thought. Your gun wasn't even loaded. Even if it had been, he'd been utterly unprepared when the birds had flown. Worse, he doubted Quill, who, unlike him, seemed to know exactly what she was doing. I'm sorry, girl, he said, bending down to give her a pat. From now on, I promise I'll try to hold up my end, beginning with, he grimaced it to himself, loading my gun. He put shells in the chamber and put the safety on. Wishing he had a chance to go hunting, even just once, with Mr. Holt and Hot Spots, in order to get a little experience, as it was, he would have to learn from Quill and the birds themselves. What had they just taught him? Quill had clearly been saying, watch me, stick with me, I'll tell you where the birds are. All Eric had to do was pay attention. It was almost as if the dog had performed a magic trick, conjuring, conjuring pheasants out of thin air. Without Quill, Eric would have walked right by them, never suspecting they were there. As for the birds, the rooster had flown solo so, so before the hens. If that was usually the case, it was important information to know. Hunters were only allowed to shoot roosters, not hens.
If the males were generally the ones to spook and fly first, he'd have to stay on his toes. He wondered what the birds had been doing when Quill pointed at them. Had they just been hanging around in the hedgerow enjoying the nice day? Somehow Eric doubted it. He looked about in the wheat field and saw some more pheasant poop, as well as several tracks in the low spots where the earth was smooth and damp. Eric guessed they had been eating the grain that had been left behind on the ground. Since the wheat stubble was only about four inches high, they would be easy for a predator to spot. He figured that when they'd seen him and Quill approaching, they'd scuttled over to the hedgerow to hide. If he was right, it was another important piece of information. He'd remember to keep his eye out for fields like this one. Eric was about to move on when he realized he was hungry and thirsty. He didn't have a watch. Who needed a watch anyway? A pioneer boy would know how to tell, tell time by the sun, but he thought he'd been walking for about two hours. He tipped the canteen up and let the water run down his parched throat. Quill watched him, her tongue hanging out panting. He quickly poured the rest of the water into the lid of the mess kit, which doubled as a bowl, and she drank. When the water was gone, she looked up, still panting thirstily. Earlier, he'd, he'd seen her take a long drink from a medium-sized pothole. The water, which was brown with green algae around the edges, had, had looked disgusting to Eric, but Quill hadn't seemed to mind it in the least. The pothole was far behind them, though... He would need to find water for her and for himself, too, pretty soon. He was going to have, have to plan ahead and boil water to fill his canteen each morning. That meant he was going to have a camp near water. Okay, good. That would be part of his plan from here on. He took the food from his pack and made two bologna and cheese sandwiches. Quill devoured hers in two seconds flat, but Eric took his time, savoring the flavor, thinking that never... Before in his life had a bologna and cheese tasted quite so fine. He and Quill each had a cookie, and then Eric ate one of the apples. To his surprise, Quill eagerly chewed up the core. The food he had brought wasn't going to last long, though not with two of them eating. They had enough for dinner that night and for breakfast and possibly lunch the next day. But very soon, he and Quill were going to have to find some more game, and he was going to have to shoot it. That made him wonder. When he did actually shoot something, would someone hear the noise and come investigate? Just as this new worry entered his mind, he had heard the sound of a faraway gunshot, then another, and another. He remembered Dr. Bob saying that the season was open for sharp-tailed grouse as well as pheasant. For all Eric knew, it was open season for deer, squirrels, rabbits, ducks, and geese, too. That meant other hunters would be shooting, not just him. People would be used to the sound and probably wouldn't pay much attention. That was good because he was going to be hunting illegally. He didn't have a North Dakota license. While there was nothing he could do about it, he and Quill had to eat. And anyway, he didn't intend to get caught. Chapter 14. When they came to their first paved road, Eric called Quill back to him and approached carefully. After making sure there was no sign of a vehicle coming from either direction, they crossed and moved quickly into the big field on the other side. Eric felt uncomfortably exposed in such open territory and kept an eye out, prepared to drop to the ground and lie flat if someone drove by. No one did. He didn't know exactly what time it was, but he didn't think Oma would even have gotten home from church. No one would be thinking of looking for him yet. But if and when people began searching, he didn't want anyone to remember seeing a boy and a brown and white speckled dog crossing this road or any other. If and when they looked for him, they'd have to look in all directions, and he and Quill, Quill had only gone in one. Also, he imagined if, he, if they did search for him, and they'd likely assume that he'd gotten lost and wanted to be found, they wouldn't expect him to be purposefully, purposely eluding them. As he and Quill traveled through the afternoon, Quill went on point three more times. Each time a group of birds flew and the roosters flushing first and the hens holding a bit longer. Eric shot each time, bam, 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 emptying the chamber of all five shells but hitting nothing. The first two times, Quill raced around, searching in all directions for the downed birds. When there were no birds for her to retrieve, she seemed confused. When no birds flew the third time either, she glanced over her shoulder at Eric with mild reproof. I'm sorry, girl, he said mis miserably. It's not your fault. Real hunting was turning out to be quite a bit different than 
shooting clay targets, and he was getting worried. Each box of shells held 25 cartridges, and he only had four boxes. He just shot off 15, and he had nothing to show for it. If he didn't improve his aim and fast, he and Quill would be in big trouble. And he had his wallet containing his allowance money, but he didn't want to risk going into a store. A sudden exhaustion came, overcame him. When it came, a whisper of fear that he had made a huge mistake. This last thought made him even more disappointed in himself. What kind of wimp was he? Anyway, he'd been out on his own for less than a day. Some pioneer. He tried to recall what advice Mr. Holt had given him when he had been at the target range. Use your front hand to start the muzzle moving in the direction of the target. Then swing at the same time you bring the stock up and mount it near your face. When the bird is moving, you can't stop your swing to shoot at it. You have to come from behind the bird, swing your gun past it, and shoot ahead of it. That was what he'd been doing wrong, he realized. He'd stopped his motion when he took his shots. What else had Mr. Holt said? Fly in with your head, then shoot with from your heart. Do your thinking before you pull the trigger. Your eyes will never lie to your hands. Then he'd said that Eric didn't get it. But now, thought maybe he did. He just had to relax and remember what he already knew. He'd do better next time. Squaring his shoulders, he shook off his trepidation. Quill, as if reading his mind, shook herself all over too. Then she looked at him with an eager doggy grin and ran ahead. As far as she was concerned, the missed shots were forgotten and she was ready to move on. Eric couldn't help but grin back. Some of the confidence and excitement he felt upon starting out that morning returned to him. The next time he checked, the sun had moved far off to the west, although it still looked fairly high in the sky. Eric knew that when, he started, when it started to drop, darkness would fall quickly. He was becoming seriously concerned about Quill. Her tongue lolled like a long, thick pink balloon, and she was panting heavily. Her, paint, her pace, which hadn't wavered all day long, was slowing, and her real legs looked wobbly. Her eager expression was gone. Her eyes glazed. When Eric felt her nose, it was hot and dry. He was beginning to panic about finding water when they came over a rise, and he saw a barn in the distance with what looked like a fenced-in corral by its side. He headed toward it. A dirt drive led to the barn from a side road too far away for Eric to see. There was an old red gas pump, but the only vehicle in sight was a rusted-out truck with no tires. It seemed safe to approach. In the corral was an aluminum watering trough with a spigot above it. Eric went over to inspect it and couldn't believe his luck when the handle turned and rusty brown water poured out. After a while, it began to clear. He took off his pack, filled the bowl-like lid of the mess kit, and set it on the ground for Quill. She drank greedily. He refilled the bowl two more times before she stopped and, and lay down, tongue dripping. She was still panting, but she already seemed much better. He gave her a quick hug before filling his canteen and taking a long drink himself. Thirst slated, he took a look around. He could almost believe he was the only human on earth, certainly the only one for miles in any direction. Although someone obviously owned the property, there were no animals in the barn or corral, and there seemed to be no reason for anybody to come out here tonight. He walked around to the far side of the barn and decided it was a good place to make camp. After spreading one of the large plastic bags on the ground, he unrolled his sleeping bag and tried to get Quill to lie on it while he collected wood for a fire. But she refused to leave his side. She even picked up a stick and carried it, dropping it on the pile Eric collected as if she knew what he was doing. He laughed, shaking his head and, and telling her, uh, for perhaps the 20th time that day, what a good smart dog she was. When the fire was going, he made four thin sandwiches uh, with the rest of the bologna and cheese. Quill gulped hers down and before, but once again, Eric took his time, watching as the flames l licked at the wood and the, the sky grew dark. He was still hungry, but he told himself that tomorrow he would hunt successfully, then cook and eat his fill of his first game dinner. All day he'd push from his mind any thoughts that what might be happening back at his grandparents' farmhouse, but they crowded in now that it was growing dark. Big Daryl was probably home and Dr. Bob would have come for Quill by now. They would have no inkling that he had run away, but were undoubtedly concerned that he'd gotten lost. He pictured Oma out in the yard anxiously scanning the deepening shadows for a glimpse of him. He imagined her coming back inside perhaps asking Big Daryl what to do. 
He saw Big Daryl sitting stone-faced in front of the snowy television screen, saying gruffly, Boy, boy will come back when he's scared and hungry. That's where, where you're wrong, Eric thought. A group of pheasants landed in the overgrown field to the east of them. Eric listened as they called to one another, gathering together for protection in the deep cover. Ducks and geese whistled and honked softly as they flew over their way to seek their own refuge for the night. Eric pictured the change that was uh, taking place all around him as the creatures of the day sought sleep, giving the prairie over to those that preferred that nighttime. Owls, deer, skunks, bats, raccoons, opossums, and an eerie call filled the darkness, a mix of yips and barks ending with that what almost sounded like high-pitched scream of a person in pain. This call was followed by another and another and another, and then all the voices joined together in a chorus, yip, yip, baroo, before fading into silence. Kyle's thrilled. Eric felt the hairs on the back of his neck rise as Quill stood and looked about, uh, whining fretfully. It's okay, girl, Eric whispered. Kyle's don't mess with dogs and people. After a moment, he added, I'm sure of that. After another moment, he murmured, pretty sure, anyway. Quill lay down beside him and curled up with her nose and her tail. Eric added sticks to the fire, breathing in its smoky tang, feeling its comforting warmth, watching its hungrily devoured his offerings. From time to time, he glanced upward where the stars were beginning to dot the sky in numbers he never saw back home. Quill loud out a lie, loud sigh and settled her head in Eric's lap. Eric stroked her head, his hands moving gently over her closed eyes. When there was nothing left of the fire but a few embers, he wriggled down in his sleeping bag and closed his eyes too. Quill snored lightly beside him, but Eric couldn't sleep. From time to time, the coyotes howled, calling each other to the hunt. Bats swooped overhead in erratic flight, chasing insects, then squeaky chirps barely audible. Over and over again, an owl gave its mournful call. Then he stopped, and in a sudden hush, Eric heard the whisper of a, of a wing beats, followed by a rustle in the grass and the squeak of a small rodent. The night was full of the sounds and movements of other nocturnal creature, creatures Eric could only guess at. There were times when the noises in the dark sounded awfully close. Sometimes it seemed that whatever was making them had to be very big, but Eric wasn't afraid, and it was, was an apprehension that kept him awake. He'd never felt quite so alive, and he didn't want to miss anything on the first night of his new life. A chill fell on the day's heat rose and disappeared into the clear, starry sky. Eric was profoundly grateful for the warmth of Quill's body and the comfort of her company. Alone out here, he might have been overwhelmed by the hugeness of the prairie. He might have felt defeated by his own smallness in the face of it. But with Quill, he felt anchored to the earth, part of it all. Chapter 15 Eric must have slept finally, because he woke to find Quill standing over him, her cool, wet nose nudging his face. She appeared to be fully refreshed after a night's sleep and ready to go. Eric sat up and looked around at the sun rising pink and new, illuminating the ragged wisps of mist that hovered over the land. In the distance, he could see a deer walking cautiously along a, lo along a line of trees, looking for a place to bed down during the heat of the day. Off to the west somewhere, a pheasant cackled. Now that he was learning to learning to look and listen, this place that had the first appeared lifeless to him was bustling with activity. He and Quill had to get moving too. They couldn't risk staying in one place too long, and they had to keep moving steadily farther from where they'd started in the event that a search party had been called out. From his pack, Eric took out peanut butter and crackers for breakfast. He smeared peanut butter on a cracker and handed it to Quill. Too late, he realized that was a mistake. The peanut butter stuck the cracker to the roof of her mouth. Looking embarrassed, she smacked her tongue again and again, trying to get it get it loose. Eric choked back his laughter and made little sandwiches with the peanut butter crack peanut butter inside the crackers. After that, soon they had emptied the jar and finished the crackers. And after Eric ate the last apple, Quill crunched happily through the core. His stomach still felt em empty, and he spent a moment recalling the eggs Oma had fried for him the morning before. Their edges crispy and the ham salty and chewy, and 
The toast, dripping with butter and topped with raspberry jam, he pushed himself to his feet. Enough of that. It was time to pick up and go. Time to find his own food. It was then that he had made the discovery that it, it was impossible to get a dog to drink if she doesn't feel like it. He filled the water bowl with water for Quill, but she took only a few quick licks. He tried to make her have more, pointing to the bowl, stirring the water with his finger and saying, Mmm, water, so tasty, reminding him of how thirsty she'd been the day before and how sorry she, she was going to be later. But in the damp coolness of the morning, she wasn't interested. He gave up and drank as much as he could, then filled the canteen. Okay, Quill, he said as they started off heading once again south. Today is the day. You're going to find the birds, and I'm not going to miss. For several hours, Eric moved carefully in Quill's wake, observing her body language over and over in his mind. He rehearsed what he would do when she went on point. He would ready his gun and walk slowly forward, mentally prepared for a bird to flush at any moment. When it went up, he'd wait for that moment when it seemed to hang in the air, lift his gun, sight down the barrel, and swing from behind in the direction it flew. He was beginning to wonder if Quill's points on the previous day had been flukes. When it happened, she began sniffing intently, moving quickly down a hedgerow, her tail going faster and faster. Eric laughed, thinking she'd almost sounded like a snuffling pig as she snorted in huge nosefuls of scent. She worked her way to where the hedgerow ended in a field to cut again. In his mind's eye, Eric saw the birds moving along in front of Quill remaining in the safety of the brush until suddenly they were forced into the wide, into the open, and <sighs> into the air went a rooster. Blam, 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 and another blam, bam, and then four hens. And to Eric's astonishment and joy, this time one of the roosters fell. Quill retrieved it and brought it to Eric. She sat before him, proudly holding it. When he extended his arm, she dropped it gently into his hand. It was obvious that Mike do Duvashin had trained her well, but Eric refused to let himself think about that. He was struck by the simple beauty of her doing so perfectly what she had been born and bred to do. Good girl, Quill, he hollered. We did it. We did it. Yahoo! He set the bird and the gun down carefully with the safety on. Then, unable to restrain himself, he pounced on Quill and they rolled together on the ground in gleeful celebration. After several moments of this, Quill rose and shook herself. She spit a few stray feathers from her mouth and looked around sheepishly, as if hoping no one had witnessed this undignified display. Then Eric picked up the bird, smoothed its feathers, and held it up to the light to admire its beauty. The head, with its bright red mask and green-purple feathers, were magnificent. There was a perfect white ring around its neck, depending on how light struck them, and the iridescent body feathers changed to include every color in the rainbow. The breast feathers, delicately tipped in black, shaded from rust to gold to amber, purple and blue-green. The tail feathers were well over a foot long, were striped with black and brown. The bird's head flopped heavily to the side, and Eric was suddenly aware of the finality of what he had done. Holding the limp, warm body that had been so full of life just a moment ago, he was flooded with, a pow with powerful remorse. This bird had hatched from an egg, been raised by a mother, and survived despite brutal weather and the sharp watching eyes of hawks and owls and coyotes. Now it was dead, and he had killed it. The enormity of th this settled upon him, and the exhilaration of a moment before mixed with regret. He felt as if he, Quill, and the pheasant had, had each played a part in a scene of ancient and natural as if earth itself. Still, he couldn't help feeling sorrow about it even if he was grateful for the meat and proud of his and Quill's accomplishment. But he put the bird in his pack and he whispered thank you to it. Someday, he knew, both he and Quill would die too. Would their bodies then nourish plants or grass that would allow a creature such as a pheasant to live? He hoped so. These thoughts were new for him, and he continued to mull over as he and Quill walked on. They ate the remaining cookies for their lunch. It was the last of their civilized food. That night they would eat from the land. Mindful of the need to camp near water, Eric began to look for a suitable spot. Quill's tongue was dragging again by the time they found a large pothole with cattails growing on the west edge uh, with some scrubby bushes on the east. The water wasn't too gross looking, at least not until Quill charged in to drink and cool herself off. That was okay, Eric thought. 
He would go around to the other side to get water, then boil it once once he had the fire going. A dead poplar tree that looked at as if it had been hit by lightning stood bravely in the middle of the grassland. Some of the branches littered on the ground, and others were easily within Eric's reach. They were perfect for firewood, which was good because he was starving, and eager to cook and eat his first wild bird. Taking it from his pack, he held it up in the late afternoon light and admired it once again. He had to clean it now. He knew that. He had to pluck it and gut it and prepare for cooking, and for a moment he panicked. I had no clue how to do this. Then he told himself, relax, think, and proceed logically. First, the tail feathers. He pulled them out and tied them in the long blade of prairie grass and put them in his pack for keepsake. Then, holding the bird in his left hand, he plucked handfuls of small feathers from the breast he was then relieved to discover they were much less tenacious than the stiff tail feathers that came out fairly easily, leaving behind the wrinkled pink-yellow skin. He worked his way down the legs and to the spurred and scaly feet, then down the back. Quill found this very interesting and dove into the piles of feathers, coming up with several stuck to her nose, then approached to, to sniff the bird intently. If you think it smell good, smells good now... Well, you just wait until it's cooked, Eric told her. The bird, naked except for its feathered head and wings, didn't look quite as noble as it had before. It was also a lot smaller than he had imagined, with much less meat on it than on the chickens his mom brought home from the supermarket. It sort of reminded Eric of the scrawny rubber chicken Patrick had given him for a gag gift for his birthday. He smiled, thinking how amazed Patrick Patrick would be if he knew Eric was hunting on his own in North Dakota with his own bird dog. The smile quickly faded, though, when he realized it was time to get down to the real work of cleaning the bird. With a Swiss Army knife, he had cut off the head, following with the wings and the feet. He remembered Patrick's dad talking about checking the bird's crops to discover what, what they'd been eating. It would reveal that kind of habitat they were frequenting. He cut into the base of the throat, and there it was, the gizzard. Mr. Holt had explained that food the bird ate stayed there for a while, getting ground up by the action of the gizzard and small stones the bird to eat. Then it could be more easily digested. Inside the transparent memory, it could see the yellow of wheat. That made sense. He'd cut it open to see what else might be, be, be there, and to his surprise, he found the shiny black bodies of crickets. He wasn't sure what this information meant exactly in terms of finding more birds, but he thought, too, it was very interesting. Quill seemed to think so, too. There was no more postponing. He took a deep breath and sliced into the belly below the breast, exposing the guts. They were slimy and disgusting looking and were already stinky. He recalled Mr. Holt saying he was he always field dressed his birds, removing the innards immediately so they didn't contaminate the meat. Next time, he would do the same. He removed the guts and carried them off into the grass a ways. Followed, Quill followed at his heels. No, he told her, wait for the meat. Then he raised the bird as well as he could in the pothole. It was time to get the fire going. He searched the brush until he found two fairly large rocks and placed them about six inches apart. Then he piled some dried grass between them and put sticks over the grass. The mess kit pot he set over the wood, edges perched on the rocks, perfect. He filled the pot with water from the side of the pothole neither he nor Quill had disturbed, set it back on the rocks and lit the fire. While he waited for the water to boil, he found a fairly stout stick, sharpened the end, and skewed the bird with it. He placed the bird over the fire to the side of the pot. Eric had been so intent on his preparations that he hadn't noticed that Quill had disappeared. He called her, and she quickly and she returned quickly, looking guilty and licking her chops. Yuck, Quill, said Eric. You are those, you ate those guts, didn't you? She sat, gazing off into the distance, the picture of innocence, and Eric laughed. I guess a pioneer dog would have done the same thing, huh, girl? He said. Nothing gets wasted, right? Well, they're all yours. You don't have to feel guilty about not sharing. The sun was sinking fast, and Eric uh, Eric was glad he'd started early to make camp. The unfamiliar task of cleaning the bird had taken much longer than he'd realized. He set out the plastic bag for his ground cloth, unrolled his sleeping bag, and got organized while there was still light to see by. Then he and Quill sat by the fire, waiting for the water to boil and the bird to roast. 
He had been hungry and thirsty before, but never anything close to the way he was feeling now. His eyes were riveted on the pot of water and the bird. Nothing seemed to be happening. He wished he'd started the fire under the water earlier. When he stuck his finger in the pot, it was barely warm. What the heck? He wondered how long does it take to boil water. Anyhow, at home, it would have taken just a few minutes on the stove top or in the microwave. He added more wood to the fire and blew on it. The flames blazed higher. He put the lid on the pot and maybe that would help. After a while, the water began to steam ever so slightly, but the water didn't seem to be cooking at all. The skin was still pale, not even close to turning a crispy brown. The water steamed and steamed, but never came to a real boil. After it would all disappear before it got fully hot, Eric took the pot off the rocks and set it in the grass to cool. He knew he had to drink some of the water tonight. People could live without food a lot longer than they could survive without water. He thought drinking enough must be especially important with all the walking he has he was doing in the dry prairie air. He rearranged the bird over the fire and concentrated on it as the stars came out and his stomach growled. Quill half napped beside him. Her eyes were closed, but her nose twitched at the smell of cooking meat that was, finally, wafting her way. Eric's own eyes felt heavy, but much more than sleep he wanted food. At one point, he must have nodded off, though, because he snapped awake to see if to see that the exposed ends of the spit had burned through and that bird had fallen into the fire. He pulled it out. The skin on one side was scorched and the entire thing was covered in a fine film of ash. But it smelled wonderful. Finally, when he could stand waiting no longer, he put the bird on the mess kit plate. It didn't look quite like the perfectly brown birds on the platter in the photo in Dan's shoebox, but to Eric's uh, famished eyes, it looked utterly delectable. He carved off half the meat and put it in Quill's bowl. He held it away from her to allow it to cool a bit. I know, I know, he told her. It's hard to wait, but you don't want to burn your tongue. And then they ate. In his former life, Eric would have pulled apart the meat raw, and part of it surely have told his mother was burned. He would undoubtedly have complained about the pellets from the meat from the bird shop, but now he barely noticed these things. To him, the bird tasted of the prairie. It was smoky and rich and wild. By comparison, store-bought chicken was tasteless, boring, dull. Wild pheasant was the finest food there was, no doubt about it. Quill seemed to agree. When Eric had finished the meat, he chewed and sucked on the bones before handing them to Quill to polish off. All too soon, there was nothing left. Eric licked his fingers for every last smidgen of flavor, then sat back with a sigh of contentment. This contentment didn't last, however, as he almost immediately realized that he was still hungry, very hungry. He knew Quill had to be hungry, too. Well, he just had to try to fill his belly with water. He examined the pot. The water looked pretty clear. There were just a few specks of something that had sunk to the bottom. Were the pioneers afraid of a little dirt? Did they have time to stop and boil their water every time they were thirsty? It seemed unlikely. What about when they were being chased by Indians? Eric looked at Quill, who was lapping happily from the pothole. He poured water into his cup and drank deeply again and again, then let out a loud belch. He felt he and Quill had done well, but he knew they were going to have to do much better if they were going to make it.